staff recommendations and the commission considered to select the Toronto Culture Report and the Dalton staff report findings. And Dr. Shea is here to recap the nomination. Oh, 
for example. His design strategy was to respond to the older building and the urban context in an appropriate way. And that is what he produced. Uh, this building is an example of the late modern uh, architecture, an important style because it expresses the growing recognition of Los Angeles as a global metropolis in the 1970s and 1980s. It, uh, the late modern architects explored ways to reinvigorate modernism, uh, responding to the new technology conditions, urbanism of the 1970s and 1980s. But neither Pereira nor the late modern, however, have been studied uh, very much or sufficiently at this point. I would note that uh, Survey LA's recent draft historic context statement on late modern by the historian Daniel Paul is a very important start. Uh, Daniel Paul identifies four distinguishing approaches to late modern architecture, the brutalist, the high tech, the neo corbusian and the sculptural. This is an example of a sculptural response to uh, this late modern design. Uh, you see it in the way that uh, he creates a sophisticated composition of horizontals and verticals receding and projecting planes each articulated with a rich palette of stone, metal, and glass. It's a very direct, intentional, urbanist solution to this building and this site. So uh, that is basically what I wanted to say, and we'll uh, pass it on. Perfect. Thank you. Don't need to burn that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, we want to get to some institutional knowledge of the building. This is a photograph of Norman Chandler, Otis Chandler's son, Donna. This is your photo. Introduce yourself and let's get started. Good morning, Commissioner, and thank you for letting me speak again. Um, my name is Donna Tarzian. I'm the former Vice President of Brand Marketing for the Los Angeles Times. I started my 25-year career there at the Los Angeles Times on January 2nd, 1991, when it was still owned by Thomas Beer. The Chandler family no longer ran the day-to-day -day operations of the company, but the presence and influence of Harry, Norman, Otis, and Dorothy continue to loom large and echo through the Kaufman, Crawford, and Herrera buildings. Their vision lived on in the hearts and minds of the people who worked there. I count myself to be among one of the devoted explorers of the building. I lived and breathed the brand and the place. I grew to love and appreciate every art deco nook and every chisel cranny of, the magnific of this magnificent newspaper tower. One only needs to enter the awe-inspiring globe lobby to feel the weight of local history and the time travel placing. Before I walked out of the Times for the last time, I was compelled to create a personal photo diary. My primary motivation was fear. Fear that what I loved most about the building was at risk the gateway forever under new ownership. Sorry. <laughs> During last week, December, I made a final pilgrimage through the labyrinth of halls from the basement up to the rooftop to record what spoke to me through a series of photographs. One of my photos is here, and I'd like to call your attention to the last line, which says, stands as a symbol of faith in California. Doesn't that say it all? I and mean, why just why we are here today? The physical site where the channelers created a newspaper that is the most important journalistic record of life in California, west of the Mississippi, deserves to be preserved for future damage. To learn where and when we came long and after we are all gone. Thank you very, very much for your consideration. I'm sorry I did virtual. That's my agent. And thank you for touring the building. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Jay, you're going, to, you're going to take us home. The staff report we really like focused on Otis Chandler in this building. Pereira edition. Jay, photograph of Otis's dad on the screen. Go. Hi. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, John Lillard. They call me Jay. I work at the Washington Angeles Times starting in 1980. I retired in 2016 as a vice president of the So I've been there a long time. During my career, I've worked in every building on almost every floor of Times Square. Square. I knew the people, the place, the power of the institution ultimately. Um, I'm here today to share just a bit of that experience with you um, and to voice my support for the preservation of this historically and architecturally important landmark. So my first job the company was the financial analyst for Otis Chambers. I actually worked for one of the Chambers. Um, 
this is you may have read this sort of a larger than my character. He truly was a little bit of a cross between Carlton Heston, Ernest Hemingway, and Cary Grant. He was just an amazing guy. Um, when you walk into his quarter office, which was in the Ferrer building, um, it, you, you were surrounded by his big inkos. And one of the things that you do is you see this office away from Mr. Chandler, there's a Kodiak bear standing over you as you, as you waited for him to, to, to meet with you. As a young financial analyst, that was pretty, pretty scary. I used to wonder whether there were the trophy heads of other financial analysts and other from adjacent to his office. Um, Mr. Chandler, it was always Mr. Chandler, was a demanding, intelligent, competitive, and insightful man. And the company reflected those leadership qualities. As experts in conservation is far more qualified than you've stated, these buildings all comprise a you know, high size for a square, are significant because they represent the architecture of their time. But equally, if not more importantly, the buildings are part of the history of Los Angeles. They are symbols and reminders of a family and of a company that shaped the city that we live in. As most of you know, the times the channels played a central role in building our aqueduct system. Without that water, there would be no Los Angeles. The Chandlers of the time also ceaselessly promoted the city and its development. Harry Chandler helped bring the movie industry, aviation, transportation, education, and the arts to Los Angeles. Curtis Aircraft, TWA, which was originally Trans Western Airlines, um, the Otis Art Institute, the Hollywood Bowl, Caltech, the Music Center, were all made possible because of this company and this family. I learned at Otis's funeral that he had worked personally behind the, uh, behind the scenes with black leaders in the city to bring peace during the, the, the Watts riots in 1965. He was the vanguard promoting minority writers and diversity in the Times newsroom. And he initiated a program called METPRO, which was specifically designed to hire and train minority, uh, promising minority journalists. Regardless of whether it was motivated by self-interest or no less belief, Southern California would be a very different and arguably a lesser place without the influence without the influence of the Chinese family. I'll skip the rest of the important stuff about the Times River Company, which is a very powerful and important company, not just Los Angeles, but around the around the, the, uh, the country. But one of the things that stands out clearly in my mind when I think about working at Times Mirror was the transition you felt viscerally when you walked from the Art Deco Times Mirror building into the modern Burr building. When you stepped across that invisible threshold between the, the Times Mirror building and the Burr building, you felt like you were walking into the future. It was palpable. The atrium and the office on the sixth floor were not only beautiful and tasteful and sophisticated, but they exuded the power of the people and the decisions that they made there. It was demanding and an amazing place to work. You could feel it. I understand that some of you were taken on a tour of the Times Mirror Square building. I wish some of us four employees could have been there to describe what the interior looked like there. Picasso's on the walls, Barcelona chairs in the lobbies, and trees in a flowing fountain from the sixth floor atrium. It was a beautiful space. Unfortunately, all this ended when Chicago Tribune purchased the Times New York Company in 2000. And yes, the past 18 years have been a rocky road for this proud, iconic, and influential company and its employees. But despite all the turmoil, the Times is still publishing, it's still influential, and it's still an important contributor to the ideas and the governance of this city. And while the Times New York Square Times Square is no longer the Times home. The buildings remain a powerful reminder of the family and the paper's influence on the city's history. The Times, Los Angeles, says, Los Angeles doesn't do much to preserve its history. You can change that. These buildings and the history they represent should be. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope you would help this uh, talk this application.
Thanks for allowing us to present. Uh, good morning, Commission President, Commissioners. My name is Mark Spector. I'm the Vice President of Development for Line Group, part of the owner of the Botany. I would like to introduce Tracy Grimes and Emily Rinaldi from the GPA Consultant for the Group Presentation. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Tracy Grimes. I'm the owner of the for the draft EIR for the proposed project should be blocked. In the draft EIR, the entire block is being treated as a historic district that's not historically significant. Um, the buildings along the east side of the block, as you may know, are already listed in the California Register and are architecturally significant, while the west side of the block is not listed in the California Register. Um, all right. Uh, since the applicants have taken a somewhat different position, I'd just like to share with you a little bit more information about why GPA concluded, along with the uh, in concurrence with the staff, that the headquarters building and the current structure do not meet criteria of three of the cultural heritage ordinance, either for their association with the way Pereira Associates or the context of modern architecture. Um, William Pereira was involved with a large number of projects over the course of his long and illustrious career. A list of his projects were attached to a memo that was submitted earlier to the commission. He formed his third firm, Her Pereira Associates, in 1958, which lasted until his death in 1985. The firm was first retained by Times Mirror Company in 1960 to modernize the Times Mirror printing and binding house on Broadway, as you might recall from the site visit. That building was partially demolished and then developed by the 1973 executive building. Uh, Prairie Associates subsequently designed numerous alterations to the Times plant and their buildings between 1961 and 1968, most notably the six story addition of the Times building in 1965. Prairie Associates were commissioned to design a new headquarters building and parking structure on the West Half of the Block in 1970. It appears that the Times Mirror Company did not retain. Um, the firm after the completion of these two buildings in 1973. Following that day, Charles Kratka, former head of Interiors for Prayer and Associates, is noted on all of the building permits as the architect for the majority of the alterations to the buildings in Times Square between 1972 and 1986. Um, this is actually an image that wasn't shared by the applicants, but I think it's, uh, it's very uh, important to show uh, between 1966 and 1968, the Times Square Company retained Prairie Associates to prepare the master plan for Times Square Square. Um, uh, the design of the western portion of the Times Square Square included a proposal for a new headquarters building that was actually separated from the Times Building by Paseo, and I think actually was more complementary to the architecture of the Times Building by picking up on all of the vertical rhythms of the solids and voids of the Times Building. Um, it featured a, uh, the design was apparently uh, for the south part of the, um, the blocks to the south was based on Rockefeller Center in New York. It featured a great central plaza surrounded by a variety of buildings and included a 50 story hotel office tower. Uh, these are reasons why the master plan wasn't realized or unknown. Um, to be significant under criterion three, a property must either embody the distinctive characteristics of the style, period, time, and of construction, or represent the noble work of a master designer, builder, architect, whose individual genius influenced his or her age. Um, GPA determined that the most applicable context within the citywide historic context statement for the evaluation of the headquarters building and parking structure um, was not late modern architecture, but rather the corporate international style. Um, I'm not sure that it's rather kind of neither here nor there since our position is that we don't think it's architecturally significant. Um, so the Times Square headquarters building exhibits some elements of the corporate international style that are listed on this slide, like the box shaped forms, the horizontal bands of windows, and the landscape plaza. But I think compared with other buildings that have been designated as HCMs in this context, it's clear that it's not an important example. Um, and that although the parking structure was designed in unison with the executive building, I don't think it's uh, a, an example of any particular style at all. Uh, the Los Angeles 
this region has countless examples of corporate international style buildings, many of which are considered extremely significant. Um, examples that have been designated as HCMs include the General Petroleum Building, most recently the musician <coughs> of Hollywood, the CBS Television City, Southern California Gas Company, and the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. In our opinion, the Times Square headquarters building is just an average example of the style that does contribute to the history of modern architecture in Los Angeles. Um, next slide. Um, then there's the matter of William Carrero. I think we can all agree that he was a master architect, um, and the Times Square headquarters and the parking structure have been presumed to be the product of his work. However, our research indicates that the identity of the designer is a little clear. Only the name of the firm appears on the drawings and the permits. There's also actually conflicting information in the Los Angeles Times about the partner in charge of the project. In a 1972 article, it stated that Pereira himself was the partner in charge, with John Knight as the project director and Shri Babcock as the deputy project director. That team was apparently replaced uh, as a 1973 article stated that Jim Long was the partner in charge, and of course, she was the project director. Her associates was responsible for the interior of the bank, and Sue Wilson acted as the designer. The interiors of the fifth and sixth floor, which were the central offices for the transfer company, were designed by Charles Cracker, who by this time had his own firm. Um, I think because so many individuals apparently contributed to the design, the extent of Premier's personal involvement in the project remains uncertain. But even, I would say even if Carrera were personally, des personally designed the headquarters building and the parking structure, they would not be considered important or distinctive examples of this work. National Park Service guidance notes that in order for a property to be considered significant as the work of a master architect, it should express a particular theme, aspect, or phase in the development of his or her career. By the early 1970s, when so the headquarters building and the parking structure were constructed, Carrera's work on singular buildings had really shifted away from the minimalist towards the more expressive and monumental forms, often rendered in concrete. Also, his practice generally had shifted from individual buildings to large scale master plans. Um, I think his work from the period would be better represented by buildings like the Pacific Life, Life Building or the Marriott Hotel in Newport Beach, or maybe even the Transamerica Tower in San Francisco, uh, and his numerous master plans, especially for airports and college campuses. So in conclusion, um, we generally concur with the staff report in that the property uh, as a whole is significant for the association with the Chandlers. Um, but, but while the east side of the block is not potentially significant, <coughs> the west side of the block is not. That concludes your presentation? Yes. Okay, any Okay, now we have Christy McAvoy. Giving us some of that information today. 
Um, this is a site that. Yeah. Yeah, um, the contributions of Otis Chandler and his family are apparent in Los Angeles. I was privileged to know Otis and his philanthropic endeavors as well as um, other aspects of his life. I believe that this site shows an evolving interests of a family of the newspaper. You heard Mr. Loring. This is a family enterprise. There are a lot of architects. There are a lot of people involved in it. It does not deserve to be reduced to parts. Holistically speaking, this is probably one of the most important sites in the history of Los Angeles and one of the most important families. And I would urge you to consider it today as a whole um, and give both the family, the architects, and the people, the newspaper family, the people who work there, their due in, um, in presenting Los Angeles' history. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Jamie Albright. I actually came to you to speak on the next item, but I'm so excited that this has come before the commission today and I have a chance to speak on it. I actually worked for the LA Times starting in 1980 when the presses were still on the first floor and they could building rumble. And um, uh, I just cannot tell you what it is meant to me as a commencement to Los Angeles to have worked in this building and been associated as a staff writer uh, and worked on the Globe Lobby exhibit when I was there. I actually can tell where it was here, but the eagle has moved to, as the time is reported, I'll call it Gundo. I'm sure you're going to find the eagle statue. It's been moved. Um, I think that this building represents everything about Los Angeles that I thought about when I grew up in Northern California. Um, the Chandler's ownership of it, I too knew Otis, I know Gary, and uh, I believe this is an absolute landmark that must be preserved. Uh, I do not, I'm not a fan of the forever building, I have to say, but I understand the appreciation of others in the architectural field who want to keep it um, as a whole. Thank you. Last tomorrow, Vice President of the Art Deco Society of Los Angeles. Uh, we're here simply to um, request that you landmark the entire site. Uh, it shows the important evolution of the times as a whole from its beginnings to its end. Uh, thank you. My name is Pauline O'Connor. Uh, I worked at the LA Times. Uh, I got a job there in 2007, and I was there for 2007-2008. And when I got the job, it was felt like a wonderful dream, but I was quickly really awakened when Sam Zell and the Chicago crew came in and basically came into the ground. And uh, you know, every week, a colleague would be gone. But uh, the one thing that one bright spot was just going into the building and feeling that it was so solid and it stood for more than the management. And I really hope that it remains the same. Thank you. Okay, you have Steve Lovman, uh, Kit uh, Simo. Pandora Sylvan. Charlie Alone. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Stephen Lefman. Um, I would like to emphasize that all three buildings be included, including the 1973 uh, for should be included in the Historic Cultural Monument. While late modern architecture is not all that popular at this time, there was a time when Art Deco was not all that popular. And that resulted in the regrettable loss of many buildings that would today have sailed through a landmark nomination. Let's learn from these mistakes, these losses of our heritage, and preserve all three of these important buildings. Thank you. Sure. Uh, my name is Kit Smimo. I'm a labor historian at, uh, teach courses at uh, CSU Dominguez Hills, and I'm here speaking on behalf of my fellow labor historians, including Professor Nelson Lichtenstein uh, at UC Santa Barbara. And we're here to urge you all to support the staff's recommendation and designate the entire LA Times complex a historic cultural monument. Uh, the Times New York headquarters is a classic example of corporate modernism, and it represents a uh, time when corporations were tethered to a particular geographic area and actually invested 
in the communities they were located in and saw them in as unique places. It was a time when corporations, including newspaper companies, more or less had direct employees that they were accountable to, rather than an army of subcontractors. Um, this all seems like fantasy in an era when your employment might be contingent, when uh, location, the local community are nearer to relevant to developers and capital. Uh, but all told, um, we really urge uh, all of you to uh, uh, preserve the history and vote to designate the entire complex a historical cultural monument. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Glenn Dana Shovelin. Um, I'm a 30 year past member of the Disneyland Hotel, and I'm here to speak up because one of William Perry's buildings was torn down, so the company could make more money. They did a really cheap tearing it down. It was an area where now it's just a parking lot. But I worked in one of the restaurants there called Lacey's Pantry. Also, prior to that, when I was 17 years old and worked as high school, I, worked, I went to school for an ROTC program where um, I got extra credit and I was a model in the summertime for summer wear for the hotel gas. Um, to see that, I have to say that this is, I hope that you keep the building the way it is because it's actually almost similar to what is no longer existing in Orange County. And thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlie Tarno. I'm a research analyst for the United Care Local 11, the Hospitality Workers Union. We're proud to be here today to support the designation of the entire LA Times complex as a historic cultural monument. Many of our members work at buildings or campuses designed by William Pereira, including the Beverly Wilshire, USC, the Sheraton Universal, uh, the, uh, when, when it was opened, the Academy Restaurant at uh, LAX and the Building, uh, or have experienced, as, as Lordana said, the loss of, of such a building. Uh, you've, you've heard from laborers when I was talking about the significance of the times. So I'm just going to get personal here. I feel like I've lived in a world and a, a, a region really designed by William Pereira, and it'd be a real shame to, to lose that. I went to school at USC, which uh, became the abode of the bicycle and pedestrian and not the car because of its 61 campus plan. My father uh, had clients at Santa Fe Springs. We passed by that Civic Center. My grandmother lived at Park Lavera next to LACMA, original design by Pereira. And so, um, and so I just hope Ferrer really helped create a modern style of modern architecture, and I hope that it's preserved. Thanks, uh, Jordan. Geraldine uh, Johnson. Mara Gerber. Yobar Lenor. Unfortunately, my commissioner was missing, and 
domination of the world And uh, almost from a kind of individual perspective, it feels like an assault on the terror legacy. So I encourage you to uh, support this uh, designation. And the, echoing what just about everybody here said, preservation is about storytelling. And if you have a story to tell about the early times, you cannot pick and choose the areas that you want. You have to tell the entire story. And the entire story starts with the first building and ends up with the last building. And so please keep it in this shape. Okay, I have uh, Monica Ferreira. And Amy is fine. And Tom Vaughn.
I think you're not on. I steal money from the city to give the Belfire of Lancaster and they my goddamn vote. So if she's here touring this shit, it's a conflict of interest. That goddamn black part of that building is a, one of the most iconic, futuristic structures that's ever been put in the city. There's nobody, nobody that I'm allowed to be torn down except the most corrupt, vile scumbags like Tom LeBach. Only goddamn people like that. I better see a yes vote to protect that goddamn black building, because that's where my Bank of America branch is, and I ain't walking seven blocks to bank, folks. Mr. Herman? Well, for the record, uh, yes, Mr. Spinner submitted a cure correct because I, a white nigger, don't get two minutes under the rules of Herman Jason Wesson, fucking tyrant motherfucker. So the issue here under the days, times, period is we want to preserve. Awful Tom Fat Fuck Babon is here to talk about children. There are no children. And if there were children here, I don't give a fuck. This is a working environment, and we're going to deal with this in a political manner, dealing with the Salvation Army for 9,945 and change regarding Ms. Gabriella Buena. So no matter what, when you're taking fucking donations and contri contribution money from fucking white nigger slave to destroy our community, fuck you and fuck you stupid ducks fucking assholes. Okay, anyone else that wishes to speak on this issue that hasn't spoken, please come forward. of this cultural historical mon monument mon nomination as a proud worker and proud Latina, especially when technology keeps every memory in the device instead to the, you know, our arch architecture. In other times, building is important not just because of the political importance of these owners, but because it told the struggles of Angelinos and helped make this place a uh, more just city. Latino journalists in 1970s and 80s in particular, push the paper to reflect my community and succeed. Here are just an example. Through the efforts of many red reporters and columnists Ruben Salazar, the LA Times was the first general publication to cover the Chicano movement. Salazar's 1970 series, Who is a Chicano? discussed the evolving in identity of Mexican Americans in the first for political representation and justice. Um, I'm asking you to complex to the, please preserve our history and entire LA um, Times complex, please. Thank you. Um, anyone else wants to speak? Yeah, I'm closing the uh, public comment period. Um, it's a real interesting, it's a real interesting subject. Um, uh, in regards to Mr. Carrera, I, as a young student architect, had an internship at Urbana Square, which was his office in um, uh, Irvine, and when he was doing work out in Orange County. And I worked um, with the architect Frank Dempster on um, a project in Houston, a master plan in Houston. I was the chief model maker for Mr. Dempster on that project. And Mr. Carrera would come and drive in his chauffeur-driven uh, Bentley uh, out to Urbana Square, or he would fly out from his helicopter out to Urbana Square <clears throat> and have meetings with us, uh, with uh, myself, I was low man on the totem pole, of course, but with Mr. Dempster and several other uh, uh, architects that were working on this uh, master plan, which was said that it was physical in nature. But my, um, you know, I was, a, I think, a junior in college, young 20-something uh, eager architect at that time. And um, I was very impressed with the gentlemanness of Mr. Carrera and the way he handled all the people that worked for him. He was very respectful of, uh, of all the uh, people that were involved with, with his uh, operation. 
Um, and he was very hands-on in terms of what he expected of us uh, and what his response was to what we were doing. Um, um, Frank Dempster was the sort of the senior architect involved, but Mr. Kerr and Mr. Dempster had very long conversations about how to move uh, mass and parking and all those kinds of things. And I think it was about a six block project that we were looking at, if I remember. Um, and I, I think I've worked in other large architectural offices uh, where the guy on the name on the front door is tends to look at the project um, as an overview, and I'm sure Barry can talk about this as well, where um, he's involved, but there are other people that are really doing sort of the dirty work of, of designing the building and making sure the program is being fit into the building and whatnot. And um, to think that Mr. Ferrer wasn't involved in this, I think, is uh, uh, an error. I think that he, he was, was uh, probably very involved because he was friends with the, the Chandlers, is my understanding. And uh, he was a, a wonderful man and enjoyed, I enjoyed working for him. I worked there two summers as a, as a college intern and it was, uh, had some very uh, wonderful memories of uh, working there. So I think that one, some, someone said today, uh, it's telling the story that this complex of buildings tells a story. And I think that is so appropriate because I think it does tell a story. It tells a story of the city of Los Angeles and how it developed and it has a sort of an architectural story that goes along with it. Um, I tend to think of the building of the Ferrer building as being more brutalist. If it was massed, if it was built in concrete, I think uh, Mr. Hess would have a different opinion about it. But I think the massing is very much uh, more sort of a brutalist the massing than it is, um, I don't know what you call it, whimsical or fantasy or something. Which I don't, I don't really see that, Mr. Hess. So um, I'm supported. Uh, I think it would be an error for our commission to not take the whole project uh, under consideration and um, and and designate this as a monument. I'd love to hear from the other commissioners, uh, Diane. Well, I think it's very interesting that we're focusing on William Ferrero. Uh, who I think most uh, LA Times readers today and in the past have never heard of, um, wouldn't recognize the Ferrer building. They wouldn't know, um, you know, that it was the headquarters of the Times. What they knew was Times Mirror Square. They were going to correspond um, in the days before digital with uh, an editor or a columnist like uh, Jack Smith. Uh, they were. Uh, correspond to Times Mirror Square. That's all you had to put on your letter was Jack Smith, Times Mirror Square, LA 90053. The public thinks of this as a, as an institution, as a business, um, as uh, uh, where their, their favorite writers worked. And um, uh, I just feel that it is uh, a city block uh, that uh, part of the Civic Center that, um, you know, the whole block is uh, significant and uh, Boy and Ferrer uh, is getting a lot of uh, great publicity on this, you know, he's passed obviously, but um, to me there's no question that the whole block is uh, worthy of designation. Gary? It's Commissioner Malofsky. <coughs> Don't lose my voice. I, I think I agree with what's been said so far, both relative to the Times Mirror as a block. It tells the story of the LA Times. The LA Times tells the story of Los Angeles and, and California. So I think it, in the progression of buildings, is it as important as any of the single buildings? <coughs> but also, in the, the, well, the presentation was, was going on, there's the image of in the part of City Hall, which is not the image that one usually sees when discussing <coughs> the Brera building. Usually it's from the other side, the comment is it's lower than the, the, the Kaufman building, it's set back to the Kaufman building as a way of sort of giving deference to the Kaufman building. But when you look at it, when looking at that slide from the side of City Hall, if you might go, you go back to that. <coughs> what was interesting to me that, that struck me 
you just noticing it. But when we did the plant building to the south of the coffee building, it was low of horizontal band windows. When Brera did in the addition, it's the same horizontal band windows, both of which emphasize the importance of the coffin building at the corner. So I think, <clears throat> contrary to what uh, Tracy Wright said, I think it's much more deferential to the, the main historic building, the main historic image, by virtue of the horizontality and not mirroring the verticality of that building. I think it's very conscious of part of the master plan. I was glad to hear that there was a master plan so that it surveys back to not only Barrera's work as an individual architect, but as a planner. I would like to urge the, the new owners um, that they look at that master plan as part of their thinking and how they proceed to develop that site. So, do you have any comments? Yes, I do. <laughs> it, um, I'm going to take this back in history a little bit because uh, all four of us, the commissioners that you see before us, you know, we all toured this building, which is not always the case, but all of us toured the LA Times building. And so we come with an informed, except one, but the four of us here that are going to vote today, we all, we all toured that building. Separate. Yes. So when we were touring through it, um, some of the speakers have talked about their experience as employees that are working in that building. I felt the ghosts of all those people that were there. And as I walked through the first one, the 1935, the 1948, and 1973, which was also a very important year in terms of journalism, because that was the time of the Watergate. And the LA Times, no not as prominent as the Washington Post, did play a role in exposing what was going on in Washington in 1973. There's also some irony in this with the speakers who have come from the labor movement. Because those of you who know about Harris the Great Otis, he was violently like just one of the most anti-labor personalities in our, in our history. So when I see you all here with me, and I, here I'm thinking he's probably just turning in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? What happened? You know, people, as you know, the history there was a bombing of the LA Times building, and people died um, during that period. But anyway, that's a so. Um, and also, you see the Norman Chandler Pavilion, which is one of the and the interior on, the, on that side. Uh, Norman Chandler was the second was the second publisher of my hand. The second, no, the third, the third. Okay, so his wife, Dorothy, who died of cancer, is right about, um, got the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. <laughs> Norman Chandler got a conference room <laughs> in the Times, in the Times building. So there's a little bit, of, you know, imbalance. But anyway, I digress. I digress. So I, I support wholeheartedly the staff recommendation. I think it's very appropriate. We are going to designate the whole site. I think from what I'm reading from the staff recommendation was that the Pereira building, though important, did not rise to the same level of significance architecturally. Is that correct? Ken, you want to correct me on that? Sure. Uh, Ken Bernstein with the Office of Historic Resources. Yes, I think correct. So the staff recommendation is that the entirety of Times Peter Square as nominated uh, be included as a uh, city historic cultural monument. Uh, we uh, are recommending that with respect to the architectural criteria that uh, we found it, it's an excellent example of its architectural styles and uh, Art Deco Modern and Late Modern architectural styles, the significant work of Master Architects Gordon Kaufman and Roland Crawford. So the Pereira building will be included within the designation certainly contributes to the other finding, which is its association with historic personages in the persons of the, the Chandler family. Um, so I think the question for the commission is whether you do want to add an additional finding under the architectural criteria that additionally you do or don't find to be a significant work of past architect William Pereira. Could I bring uh, Alan Hans back to the, to the desk and ask him a question? I'm. Uh, I have closed the public hearing. You're real. Am I going to get in trouble? Mm -hmm.
Uh, Mr. Hess, the uh, question I have is, is that when prayer was not, no, not um, known for doing additions onto historic buildings, I mean, it wasn't his bread butter. Did I say that right? Anyway. Um, so do you know any other William Prayer buildings that were similar to this? A very good question. And this is Alan Cast. A good question, and I'm, I'm just kind of trying to go through it in my mind. Um, I would certainly say it was extremely rare in Pereira's career that he would add on to a historic building. And at that time, um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, historic preservation, adding to historic buildings was not as common as it is today. That's very true also. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Could I make one more? I mean, because you mentioned the brutalist aspect of this building, I do agree with that in its composition, it has some very strong brutalist elements, but it is not the concrete. Yeah. Okay, um, I think one of the things that we want to um, make sure that is in, that's included is that the globe in the lobby, um, is we consider that as part of the lobby. It's tied down to the floor. It's not a picture that you can take off the wall. And we feel that it's important that, uh, that this uh, globe and its base and all of the parts associated with it uh, are part of uh, this of this monument. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Barron, again, Ken Bernstein. Uh, yes, and uh, the staff are, uh, through the Office of Historic Resources, we've communicated to uh, both the, uh, the new owners, uh, Ani, and the uh, Times as an institution through their representatives that we do consider the globe, uh, as well as the base of the globe sits on, the marble flooring, the Hugo Battle murals, those features of the lobby that are integral to that space, that those are significant character-defining features of the lobby, and that uh, any alteration or removal of any of those features would constitute a substantial alteration of the building under our cultural heritage ordinance, and therefore requires review by the Cultural Heritage Commission and by our staff. Um, I will say, because the, uh, the issue has been raised again today, um, while uh, it is certainly regrettable that uh, other uh, long-standing features of the lobby, including the Eagle, including the bus of former publishers, had been removed, um, because those were not uh, architectural features or designed uh, initially to be integral to that space, uh, that, well, again, while we would welcome and encourage those features to be removed, or to be returned back to the lobby, um, we did not find that uh, the removal of those features rose to the level of a substantial alteration of the building itself. So I just wanted to make that distinction, but we communicated in strong terms to the Times uh, the distinction with the globe, the, uh, the other remaining features of the globe lobby. Just put that to the record. Okay, I'd like to bring up the idea of altering the uh, staff report to include the prayer building as a, uh, a significant uh, architectural uh, element within the Times Square Square. And I'd like the commissioners to comment on that. Barry? I'll second that. You're with me on that? Diane? You want to say you're with me in the microphone? Yes, I concur. I would just like to hear from staff first about further their, their reasoning in not including it. Remember? Lambert, D. Singer, um, staff of Office of Historic Resources. Well, I think the staff report clearly laid out that we didn't feel that the prayer piece rose to the level of a significant work of William Pereira. But certainly, given where the commission's desire is to go, I think you can modify uh, finding number two by adding William Pereira at the end of that sentence. I think that will achieve the commission's goal of adding into the mix under significant work. That would include so instead of two architects, we have three. There'd be three in that, that, that second finding of the staff report. Okay. 
Any other comments, commissioners? We have a motion, Barry. Sure, I move that we designate the Times Mirror Square uh, at local addresses on Broadway and Spring Street. The City Council Monument determine that the proposed designation is categorically exempt from C Club. Determine the property conforms to the definition of monument. Recommend the City Council consider and declare the subject property as a monument. Yeah, uh, that we that this afternoon work with Miles and the county member to include prayer as a significant architect. Uh, and otherwise, we accept the same. Commissioner Janner, I'm second. Roll call. And a motion on CDA. We have a first and second motion on the floor. Commissioner Malonsky, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Cameron, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Bernard, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Barron, how do you vote? Yes. Motion passed.